last message in Matthew 13 for a while. As soon as I get to start the break for the legalism series. Okay. Good to go, Jared? Very good. Okay. But as I said, tonight we're in Matthew. Still uh, plowing through the fourth section of Matthew, as I understand it, calling this uh, portion, Jesus has disciples who believe the signs, while the opposition becomes more stubborn. And our study of this fourth section has so far been mostly here in 13, chapter 13, where we have this section of the parables, where they're all pretty much about the kingdom of heaven. And I've titled that the parables of the kingdom for disciples of the kingdom. Uh, because I think that that pretty well sums up the thrust of the passage. And uh, all of that really is going to be coming to a kind of a head tonight in what I'm going to be saying, because we've actually come to the end of the parable section, and now it's time to do kind of a summary. Um, I could just move on, and really I guess that would mean going on to the legalism series, because I do plan to do that as soon as we're done here with these parables. But I wanted to do a message that pretty much gives a summary... Uh, treatment of the main ideas of these parables. You know, we spent so long in them, I hate to just leave them and not do any kind of uh, recapitulation. So that's what I'm going to try to do tonight. Nothing really unusual in that regard, just a kind of summary message. Now, I am mainly interested in those summary ideas that I mentioned, but I'm also interested in the overall structure of this collection. The parables as a unit, if you want to think of it as a literary unit, as Matthew has compiled them. I am interested in that. And as I taught through Matthew 13, I decided, as I got to a certain point in it, that Matthew does have a kind of structure behind his parables. There is a kind of mentality in his head of how to order these as he writes down the parables of Christ. And I do want to explain that structure. That's what I'll be trying to do as we go through this message, trying to explain the structure that Matthew has. Now, on the one hand, I do think my observations are correct on the matter of structure. Otherwise, I'd not be saying them. I'd be uh, reserving them for the back of my thoughts if I weren't too sure of them. But uh, on the other hand, I have to admit the structure that I'm going to be presenting is kind of strange. It's not exactly a straightforward kind of thing. And if you get to looking at the handout I just gave you, you'll see why. There's a reason it has to be brightly colored and everything because there's a lot going on there. Uh, it's just it's just kind of strange. It's not exactly the most straightforward structure that I've seen in a portion of scripture. So in short, I care most about the ideas, okay? I really care more than anything about the ideas that Matthew has been focusing on as he's been recording these parables from Jesus. But I do care about the structure. It's less important, but I do care about it. And I do think it reinforces the ideas. But, you know, if the structural aspect of this is kind of weird for you, don't worry about it too much. It's, it's the lesser of the two things I want to talk about. Big thing is the ideas. Now, as for what those ideas are, uh, let me give you my outline. Uh, I've called this, this message the disciple of the kingdom because all of these ideas pertain to what a disciple of the kingdom is like. So this is the disciple of the kingdom, and I've decided that there are four big ideas that Jesus uses to describe a kingdom disciple. So here in the parables, Jesus' view of what a disciple is like, here you go. Number one. The disciple understands the mysteries of the kingdom. And that one is foundational to all of them. Secondly, the disciple understands the importance of the final judgment. Not necessarily a point I was expecting, but I think it is there. Thirdly, the disciple understands patience and sacrifice in the context of the final judgment, which I also think is something Matthew does toward the end of this collection. And then finally, the disciple understands the kingdom as the fulfillment of God's past actions. So a connection to what God has done in the past and how the kingdom relates to all of that. The disciple understands all those things. Now, I've been saying that here in the fourth section of Matthew, uh, Jesus has disciples who believe the signs while the opposition becomes more stubborn. We haven't seen much of the opposition, but we've seen a lot about the disciples. And really this summary message here hones in pretty carefully on what a disciple is like. So really, we're going to be figuring out that question. Who are these disciples who believe the signs? What are they like? What kind of people are they? So that's the question we're asking from the standpoint of studying Matthew. 
The other related question is, are you like those disciples? Right? Now, do you fit the description? As we go through these four points that I have, are you them? You know, are you those things? So I'm going to try to bring all of this back to that question every time we go through one of these ideas and try to make sure that you, you know, as a professing disciple of Jesus Christ, actually match the description that Jesus gives of his disciples. So that is generally what we're trying to do tonight. You know, again, just kind of a summary, get everything in one message kind of message. <clears throat> Point one here, the foundational one. The disciple understands the mysteries of the kingdom. He has comprehension of these things that Jesus has been trying to teach. You're going to find that a disciple is first and foremost someone who understands Jesus, which is no small thing considering the fact that most of the world does not understand Jesus, at least not well enough to actually follow him. Even if the mysteries of the kingdom are cloaked in parables, the follower of Jesus will understand them. And even if Jesus must help them understand those parables, they will eventually understand. You see Jesus giving at times interpretations of these parables to sort of help his disciples along. But the implication is by the end of it all, the disciple understands. And they say they understand by the end of the chapter. So uh, we're going to take their word for that and say, yes, they understand. The disciple, above all else, understands the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. Now the first half of this parable collection, and actually its very end, focuses on that theme of understanding. That is the overarching idea from beginning technically to the end, uh, but especially in the first half, this idea of understanding. Now let's start with the first half of it, the first, really, almost exactly the first half of this collection of parables. It really does form a noticeable unit when you read it. It does kind of hang together, and that noticeable unit does focus very much on this theme of understanding. And I want to go ahead and read it for you, verses 1 through 23. I'll try to emphasize these places where understanding or knowledge become important, but here we go, just read the whole thing. <clears throat> that same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea, and great crowds gathered about him, so that he got into a boat and sat down, and the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, A sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose high, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. Then the disciples came and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? And he answered them, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For to the one who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. This is why I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. Indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, You will indeed hear, but never understand. You will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart, and turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. Truly I say to you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. As for what was sown on the rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, Yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while, and when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. As for what was sown on the good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit 
and yields in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. All of that to say, the first half of this parable collection does form a very noticeable unit. A lot of it is framed around that parable of the sower and some comments Jesus makes in the middle of that that are related to it. But more than that, the theme of spiritual understanding goes through the whole thing. The word understanding or know, see, hear, perceive, words like that all throughout that unit. So all of that you see there, um, understanding, pretty big at the very beginning of this section. Now what you may not have noticed is that when Jesus comes to the end of this collection, he returns to that idea of understanding. Now I didn't notice that either until I got back there myself as I was studying through this, but uh, it's here. Let me read you the very last parable in this collection, which was what I taught on last time, the parable of the housemaster, starting in verse 51. Have you understood these things? They said to him, yes. And he said to them, therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. So there you have it again, the big question, the final question. Do you understand all these things I've been talking about? He comes right back to that theme of understanding. So this parable sermon is not a random barrage. Jesus isn't just saying, hey, I thought of all these parables, you know, along the way, figured you want to hear them. No, they're all kind of dedicated to this one goal of making sure the disciples understand. And everything Jesus does in here is honed in on that one question. He asks them at the very end, do you understand? And if their answer is yes, then he succeeded. So this whole section of parables here, from beginning to end, probably more at the beginning, but still at the end, is framed around this idea of understanding. Now, <clears throat> that's the uh, structural matter. Based on that structure, based on that idea, you know, here is our first description of the disciple of the kingdom. He understands the mysteries of the kingdom. He has comprehension of these things. And I can think of no better way to discuss that point than to use the two parables used by Jesus to discuss that point which are the parable of the sower and then the parable of the housemaster at the very end. So here again, just asking yourself, do you fit this description? Are you this kind of disciple? Do you understand as a disciple ought? First of all, in the parable of the sower, the disciple of the kingdom has a fruitful mind. To use the term that I used 100 years ago when I first taught on that parable, the disciple has a fruitful mind. He avoids the mistakes made by everyone else and his mind is productive with the word of the gospel that he hears. First of all, he's not like the pathway soil. He is not stubborn against the gospel, and he does not fall victim to satanic forgetfulness. He's not like just the seeds that fall on the hard ground, can't get any you know, depth there, and the birds just come and eat it up. He's not like that. Secondly, he's not like the rocky soil. He does not make a shallow commitment, and he does not fall away when the Christian life gets difficult. You know, he's not like those plants that spring up immediately, but then get scorched away by the sun because their roots don't go deep enough. The true disciple is not like that either. Also, he's not like the thorn-covered soil. He is not so full of worldly cares that he has no room for the gospel. He's not like those thorns that choke out any effort of those grain seeds to grow. No, the disciple's mind is open to these things, and there's plenty of room for them to grow. So the disciple of the kingdom is like the good soil. He avoids all the mistakes made by everyone else. He's not stubborn. He's not shallow. He's not consumed by all this other stuff that's less important. He's not any of those things. The disciple understands these things well enough to avoid all those mistakes and pursue above all else the word of the kingdom. Have you done so? Okay. Are you like that good soil? Are you like the disciples who had a fruitful mind? Are you that way? Similarly, are you like the... Uh, the scribes of the kingdom described in the parable of the housemaster, which Jesus uses here at the very end. Have you, in other words, been challenged by what you understand? Now, in my message on that parable, I pointed out the uh, word used for understand, used there when Jesus asked the question, do you understand these things? I uh, neglected to uh, notice also, here in hindsight, everything is twenty twenty that uh, toward the beginning of this parable collection, he actually uses the same word for understanding, for understand, that I was defining for you the last time I spoke. That word, tsuneami, it means to have an intelligent grasp of something that challenges one's thinking or practice. So it's not just sort of bare mental assent, 
It's you understand these things well enough to where they challenge you. They make you think about what you're doing. They make you think about your attitudes. Make you realize that maybe things have to change here. So that's what the disciple is like. That's the kind of understanding you're supposed to have by the time you reach the end of these parables. You're supposed to be challenged by those things. Now, of course, <clears throat> this is a fair question. You know, when you, when you find yourself understanding these things and actually following along with Jesus here, the temptation is spiritual pride because you understand what so few in the history of the world have actually understood. The idea that you are now to be challenged by these things kind of takes the wind out of you in that now you have to begin this long overhaul of your life as you bring your life under the control of these things that should be challenging your thinking. It's not just these you know, nuggets of truth back there in the back of your mind that you can just hang on to and use to impress people. No, no, you're supposed to bring those forward and have your life challenged by those things. Again, have you been doing that? Because if not, you're not like this scribe of the kingdom, these disciples here, that you're supposed to be. You're supposed to be challenged by these things that you understand. <clears throat> now I can say one more thing, also partially from Matthew's structure here, uh, but also from both of the parables, the parable of the sower and the parable of the housemaster, and that is that the understanding of the disciple breeds more understanding from new disciples. The knowledge of the disciple actually spreads to other people who become disciples and help disciples learn. In the parable of the sower, the disciple bears fruit, just like a grain seed does. Eventually it grows up, it puts forth its fruit, and it spreads. To differing degrees, yes, some 30-fold, some 60, some 100, but still bearing fruit. They all bear fruit to some degree. Also in the parable of the housemaster, you have the disciples viewed as scribes of the kingdom. The chief goal of a scribe is not only to study things well enough to know them himself, but to teach them to others. One of the big aspects of a scribe's work is to actually pass on his understanding. So there you go. You have in both parables here not only the idea that the disciple understands, but that he now becomes the conduit for other people to understand these things as well. The man who keeps this understanding of the kingdom to himself shows that he does not truly understand it because he is not truly a disciple of Jesus. The disciples don't just hoard this stuff for themselves. They spread it out. They bring out the treasures old and new, to use the, uh, the wording of the parable of the housemaster. The true disciple is that way. The true disciple understands the mysteries of the kingdom to that degree and in that way. <clears throat> now, to be even more specific as to what is understood, point two here, the disciple understands the importance of the final judgment. Kind of a strange thing to say, to single out here out of all this stuff that Jesus has been talking about. Why the final judgment? Well, I do think it's here. I do think Jesus himself singles out the final judgment, and Matthew faithfully records that. And I would say that the only person wanting the final judgment more than you should be Christ himself, uh, based on the way this parable collection ends. There's a very big emphasis on you comprehending the importance of the final judgment. Again, we'll start with the structure or the way Matthew has recorded these parables. Just as the first half of the collection has a common theme, spiritual understanding, the second half of the collection also has a common theme. And that common theme is the final judgment. It is the one per pervasive idea throughout the second half of this parable collection. Now I'm going to read that second half here in a minute, uh, just, so you, just like I did with the first half so you can see those things. I want to tell you what to watch for, because maybe it's not as easy as just emphasizing the words. First of all, watch for this. Jesus actually describes the final judgment three different times throughout the course of this second half of the collection. You have the parable of the weeds, you have the interpretation of the parable of the weeds, and then you have the parable of the net. All three of them provide a description of some sort of the final judgment. He mentions it three times. The repetition of that gives you the idea that this is important to him, that the final judgment is something he really wants you to pick up on here in the last half of this collection. Secondly, Jesus not only repeats the idea, he sometimes repeats phrases throughout this second half of the collection. When Jesus describes the, parable, the judgment in the parable of the net, he actually uses some of the same phrases that he used from his interpretation of the parable of the weeds. There are phrases that he used there, and then he used them again. So some repetition of exact words even. So that's supposed to catch your memory. It's supposed to stick in there as something you remember, which lends itself to emphasis. 
Thirdly and finally, uh, Matthew spaces these references to the final judgment throughout the last half of the collection. They're not all bunched together. They're spread out throughout the last half of these parables. Uh, Matthew, occasionally, the way he records these parables, he does leave the topic of the final judgment, but only to come back to it again. And then he leaves it again, only to come back to it again. He keeps circling around back to this idea of the final judgment. He doesn't want your mind to get too far away from the idea of the final judgment. I think you see all of that in the second half here. So let's just go ahead and read the, the next half of the, uh, the collection. Verse 24 through 50. He put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared also. And the servants of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? He said to them, An enemy has done this. So the servants said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he said, No, lest in gathering the weeds you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at the harvest time I will tell the reapers, Gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. And he put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of a mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it has grown, it is larger than all the garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a leaven, is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour till all was leavened. All these things Jesus said to the crowds in parables. Indeed, he said nothing to them without a parable. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter what has been hidden since the foundation of the world. Then he left the crowds and went into the house. And his disciples came to him saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, The one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed is the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the close of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so it will be at the close of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers, and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. He who has ears, let him hear. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. And when it was full, men drew it ashore and sat down and sorted the good into containers, but threw away the bad. So it will be at the close of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. <clears throat> That's the second half of the parable collection. Now having read that, you see, I think, again, as I said, the final judgment is pretty common to that second half. He talks about it, he leaves it for a little bit, comes back to it, leaves it again, comes back to it again in this way that's very noticeable once you're looking for it. The final judgment is the common binding theme of that second half of this parable collection. So on that basis, I say that the disciple understands the importance of the final judgment. So not just the uh, understanding in general, understanding the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, there's a particular emphasis on specifically the final judgment. Jesus wants you as his disciple to be a disciple of the final judgment. He wants you to have that idea in your head often. He wants it to be a very uh, biting idea in your head. Now, if you think that's excessive to focus so much on the final judgment, I want to give you some reminders on a few points about the final judgment so you won't think of it as this kind of overkill kind of thing. Some reminders here. First of all, <clears throat> your entire life with its every action has been moving toward one point. 
And that is the final judgment. Everything in your life, at some point, everything you have done is going to terminate there. Okay, so there's one thing. Secondly, the quality of your eternity will be determined by a single decision made on a single day. And that is the day of the final judgment. So after that point, everything you ever will be, everything you will ever do is going to be determined by that one day, the day of the final judgment. That's pretty big. Thirdly, the course of human history has followed an unbroken pattern for thousands of years. But that pattern will be broken and forever changed by one thing, the final judgment. You know, all of history as you've known it, the way it's unfolded, the way humans keep doing the same things over and over and over again, all of that ends and gets transformed on the day of the final judgment. A pretty big day for planet Earth. Fourthly, Jesus Christ will be honored even by those who spent their whole lives rebelling against him. And that will happen on the final judgment. You see, now, people who don't follow Christ, they don't even care. On the day of the final judgment, they'll care. I mean, on that day, there's going to be a complete reversal of the way their mind thinks about Jesus Christ. And it's not necessarily going to do them any good, but they're going to see the error of their ways. And it's going to happen in that one place, that one time, the final judgment. Finally, think about it like this. Kingship, right? We're talking about the kingdom of heaven, okay? Well, how is a king's kingship most firmly and forcefully manifested? I would say when he is on his throne, hearing an argument or a case, and he makes the decision what's going to happen. There's no appeal, there's no reprieve, there's no but this or but that. The king on his throne says, this is how it's going to be. And for the kingdom of heaven, that day is going to come when Jesus Christ sits on his throne and judges every single person in the entire world, every single case that has ever been. That's going to happen on the final judgment. It's the one day when the kingship of Jesus is going to be most fully manifested in a way that only a king can manifest his kingship. That's the final judgment. That's why this is such a big deal. It's not wrong to have this on your thoughts a whole lot because it's a pretty big concept and it's a pretty weighty one too. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to say that the disciple of the kingdom needs to live in fear of the final judgment as though being terrified of being cast off into hell. That's not what I'm talking about. Thinking of the final judgment isn't only about that. I think that is part of it. I mean, one half, maybe more, of the final judgment is condemnation. But for the disciple of Jesus, it's not quite that way. Verse 43, the hope that Jesus extends to his disciples is this. The righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. You know, so when I say you should be thinking about the final judgment, I don't necessarily mean you know, the fear of being condemned. I mean also the hope that is yours if you, if you persist in following Jesus. If you continue in their faith and repentance you have now, that is yours. So don't get me wrong, I'm not just loading it down on the negative side of the final judgment. The positive side is there too. I think you should have both in your mind. <clears throat> on that note, taking both together, the value of the final judgment for the disciple is infinite. And when I say infinite, I mean infinite because it's going to keep going on forever and ever. The value of having the final judgment in your mind as a motivation, as a lens through which you view everything, as a lens through which you view everything, is very important, so important, it's going to determine your eternity. Let's think about a few things. The disciple, in order to be a disciple, has to endure the wickedness that he sees around him. He has to put up with all the sinners that are practicing their sins around him. Well, he can endure that wickedness because he knows that the wicked will not thrive forever. There will come a day when the wicked are dealt with and put away in a place of judgment where he will be free of them. That is, of course, an appeal to the final judgment. The disciple also must suffer persecution. All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, just as Paul says. Well, the disciple can suffer persecution because he knows his enemies will not escape justice. For every wrong that he suffers at the hands of his persecutors, there will be a recompense. That makes the persecution bearable. Of course, again, an appeal to the final judgment. The disciple also must work his righteousness in secret. Matthew chapter 6, you can't go you know, grandiosely you know, broadcasting the fact that you're a righteous person. You've got to be humble enough to have these things in secret, right? 
Well, you can work secretly because you know someday God's going to reward you openly. On the day of the final judgment, Christ brings his reward with him. Also, the disciple must humble himself under the hand of God, as Peter says. 1 Peter 3, I think that is. The disciple must humble himself under the hand of God. And humbling yourself under anyone's hand <clears throat> is very hard. But you can do that because you know there is coming a day when God is going to exalt you with that same hand. And that time of exaltation is going to be the final judgment. The final judgment in all these ways, it really is the jet fuel of the disciple. I mean, it has infinite value for you. It helps you live this life, the life of a disciple. It's pretty big. So for that reason, <clears throat> I think Matthew implies by his structure here and the way he loads up the last half of this collection with the final judgment, Matthew tells us that you need to understand that. You need to have comprehension and be challenged by this idea of the final judgment. So the question again is, does that describe you? Are you that kind of disciple? Does your mind return to the final judgment as often as Jesus' mind returns to the final judgment in this collection of parables? Is it a recurring thought? Does your mind leave it only to come back to it, just as Jesus does here in these parables? Because the true disciple understands the great weight of the final judgment, and he thinks accordingly, and he acts accordingly. It governs his life, the final judgment does. <clears throat> so there is something else you have to have as a disciple. That should be one of the traits that is yours. Third thing here, point three. The disciple understands patience and sacrifice in the context of final judgment. So no, we're not quite done with the final judgment yet, but this is a distinct point because we're moving on to these ideas of patience and sacrifice. But I view them in the context of the final judgment. And I do that because of one more feature of Matthew's rather interesting structure as he puts these parables together. I've said that the second half of the collection is dominated by a concern for the final judgment. I just argued for that, and I did mean that. However, there are some notable intrusions in that second half. There are interruptions into this idea of the final judgment as Jesus is unfolding it in these parables. The first intrusion is the, uh, has the parables of the mustard seed and the leaven, verses 31 through 33. He put a parable before them saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it has grown, it is larger than all the garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable, The kingdom of heaven is like leaven, that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour till all was leavened. There is your first intrusion into this stuff about the final judgment. There's a second intrusion, the parables of the treasure and the pearl. <clears throat> and that is verses 44 through 46. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value, went and sold all that he had and bought it. There is your second intrusion into this idea of the final judgment. So you have all this stuff about the final judgment coming up repeatedly in the second half but then these two notable interruptions into all of that. Now, <clears throat> not only do you have these interruptions, it's kind of interesting, the interruptions are very similar to one another. They are the same kind of interruption. Both intrusions have a pair of parables. You have the mustard seed and the leaven over here, and you have the treasure and the great pearl on the other side. Both intrusions use very short parables. None of those four parables are very long. I mean, they're very brief, you know, quickly done, get you back onto the idea of the final judgment. Also, both intrusions use parables which have roughly the same meaning. You know, the parable of the, uh, of the leaven and the parable of the mustard seed, same basic idea. The parable of the treasure and the pearl, same basic idea. So not only do you have these two intrusions, they're both very similar to each other. I mean, there's like mirror images going on here. Once more, we get the impression then that Matthew has a very deliberate structure going on. He actually thought about this before he started writing. He wanted these things to be written out in this way. So the question to ask is, why do that? Why has Matthew organized these parables in this way? Why has he used interruptions? <clears throat> the only answer I could give to that is that Matthew wants us to consider the themes 
of those four interrupting parables in the context of the final judgment. As you're thinking about the final judgment, he wants you to be thinking about these other things as well, but in the context of the final judgment. If these four parables were supposed to be considered alone, Matthew would have put them alone. He would have finished his stuff about the final judgment and then glumped, the, glumped these other four parables together by themselves away from all that stuff. But that's not what Matthew did. He scattered it all together. He gives you this big passage about the final judgment and then you know, gives you these interruptions here and there as well. I mean, he wants you to think about these things together. He wants you to think about these four parables in the context of the final judgment because that's where he put them as he actually wrote his gospel. <clears throat> so let's do that. Let's think about you know, these four parables here, these you know, pairs of parables, in the context of final judgment. And let's ask ourselves, are we this kind of disciple? Do we understand this aspect of things as well? First of all, the disciple understands patience in the context of the final judgment. So emphasis on patience here. The one idea that you get from both the parable of the mustard seed and the parable of the leaven is the agonizingly slow growth of the kingdom. No matter how much you want the kingdom of God to be here in its fullness right now, it's not going to happen. You're going to have to wait. You're going to have to wait a long time before the kingdom is fully formed. So naturally, the disciple must have patience to endure that slow growth. If he can't sit down and wait for something, he's not going to do very well in the kingdom of heaven because that's not how the kingdom of heaven works. He must have patience. Even as he sees the people of the world try to cut down the great tree that is one day going to shelter them all. You know, even as this great tree, which is a beneficial empire, the way I described it back in the day, even as these people fight against this good thing, the disciple has to sit patiently and endure that. And as the rest of the world slanders the growth of the kingdom, just as leaven is considered an evil influence, as I talked about back then, even as the disciple sees that kind of slander going on as the kingdom spreads, he has to endure that as well. He has to be patient as all this stuff happens around him. Now, where is the disciple going to get this patience? How is he going to sit there and endure this hardship, bear these things patiently? Well, he needs to remember that on the day of judgment, when he is exonerated forever, and when wickedness is exterminated forever, on the day of judgment, he will not regret his patience. On the day of judgment, he is going to say, oh, I am glad I patiently endured all those things. I'm glad I had perseverance because now Jesus has come with his reward and all this terrible stuff has been dealt with. He will not regret his patience on that last day. And the disciple of Jesus understands that. He understands the importance of patience, especially in the context of the final judgment. That's where he gets his patience. The disciple of the kingdom understands that. Secondly, the disciple also understands sacrifice in the context of final judgment. As he has to sacrifice things, he does that thinking about this future judgment that is going to take place. You get this from the other two parables, the parable of the treasure and the parable of the pearl. In both of those parables, we learn <clears throat> that the disciple is going to have to sacrifice if he wants to inherit the kingdom. You're not getting in the kingdom unless you give something up. You know, the, the way in is too narrow. You've got to throw stuff off of you before you can enter through that narrow gate. Now, that concept is easy to grasp, the concept of sacrifice, because really all you're doing is you're exchanging a lesser treasure for a greater treasure. And that's always a good deal, right? You know, the practically worthless treasures of the world in exchange for eternal treasures. You, know, you get that. And that makes sense. And the final judgment certainly highlights that. I mean, the reward that Jesus brings with him at the end is going to be better than anything you ever had to give up here. So the final judgment helps you there too. It also helps you in another way. You know, sometimes these, uh, these promises of heavenly reward, they are a little abstract. We don't know a whole lot about them. You know, the, uh, the treasures that you have now in the world, there are things you can see, you can touch them. In a sense, they're more real to you. Even though your hope is out there, you know, these things that you see here, they're pretty gripping because they're tangible. They're in the here and now. Sometimes it's hard to give up these things that are more impressive in order for these things that are a little more abstract, a little more theoretical, if you want to use that word. So how do you do that? Well, you may not have a good concept of heavenly reward, but I'm willing to bet you do understand the concept of judgment, punishment, and torment. I mean, those are things that you experience to some degree here now as you incur the negative consequences of your poor decisions. So even if you aren't motivated, if you're not, not high-minded enough 
to be motivated by this great reward that Jesus brings with them. At least you'll remember the other half of the final judgment, and that'll set you straight. So either way, you like whether you appeal to the good half or the bad half of the final judgment, this helps you make those necessary sacrifices. This final judgment is what helps you give you that idea, that, that ability as a disciple to make these sacrifices. So all that to say, you have patience, you have sacrifice. These are made possible when viewed in light of the final judgment. If patience and sacrifice are mere drudgery to you, then I don't think you understand what a disciple is supposed to understand. Because the disciple, see, he views these things in the context of the final judgment, and that's where he gets his ability to be patient and to sacrifice these things. And that is the way you ought to be as a disciple. So again, are you like that? You know, do you match that description of a kingdom disciple? There is one more point here, one more trait of a kingdom disciple. Number four, <clears throat> the disciple understands the kingdom as the fulfillment of God's past actions. The disciple understands that he is just at the tail end of all this stuff that God has already been doing. <clears throat> now, um, I gave a kind of sub subtitle to this point, and I subtitled it, uh, The Reason You Should Not Ignore the First Three Quarters of Your Bible, you know, referring to the Old Testament. Another good reason to read the Old Testament is because everything you're experiencing now is just the fulfillment of all those things back then. I don't think anyone here has fallen victim to that, but if you are a strictly New Testament Christian, you need to broaden your reading a little bit and get back there a little further, back to the Old Testament. Now, I get this observation once more from Matthew's structure. There's one other thing that he does that I find interesting, and the more I look at it, the less I can ignore it. So uh, let's go ahead and talk about this. Matthew includes two Old Testament quotations in this parable collection. He breaks away. You know, one of them seems to be in the mouth of Jesus. One of them seems to be provided by Matthew. But in both cases, there are an Old Testament quotation inserted into this parable collection. And along with both of those, Matthew notes that Jesus fulfilled something mentioned in that quotation. There is a connection between what is described in the quotation and what Jesus is doing at this moment in these parables. Let's just go ahead and read those. The first quotation is from Isaiah, and that is in verses 14 through 15. This is Jesus talking. Indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, You will indeed hear, but never understand. You will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. So there is quotation number one from Isaiah. The second quotation is from Psalm 78, which was written by Asaph. This is verses 34 through 35. All these things Jesus said to the crowds in parables, Indeed, he said nothing to them without a parable. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter what has been hidden since the foundation of the world. So there's your second quotation. Now, not only does Matthew include those quotations, he does so in a balanced way. And that's the word I want to use, balanced. He does so in a way that creates a, uh, a kind of, well, balance between the two halves of this collection. Uh, in the first half of this collection of parables, you have the Isaiah quotation, right? It's right there in that first half on understanding. The Isaiah quotation is right there and actually fairly in the middle. Fairly in the middle of the first half of this collection, you have an Old Testament quotation. <coughs> then the quotation from Asaph is in the second half of the collection, the half dealing more with the final judgment. And again, it's roughly in the middle of that second half. So you have... You know, both halves of the parable collection containing a fulfillment quotation, creating a sense of balance between those two halves. You have an Old Testament quotation here, Old Testament quotation here, fulfillment here, fulfillment here, on both sides of the scale. So you have that balance there. <clears throat> also, I think in each case, the placement of the quotations makes sense if you're wondering, uh, you know, why Matthew would do it this way. Well, again, he shows himself that he has his brain on as he is writing this, because in the first half, Jesus discusses the present lack of understanding among the people, and it's in that context that he quotes the Isaiah passage, which is about how the people don't understand. I mean, it just fits in right there with what Jesus is talking about as he gives these parables. In the second half, you have this parable 
the, uh, the leaven parable, where it talks about the kingdom being hidden, you know, the truth of God being hidden there in that lump of dough. Well, then you quote the Asaph quotation, and what's it about? Hid, hidden truth. Hidden truth right there. Following reference to something hidden in leaven. Well, now you have truth that's been hidden since the foundation of the world. In both cases, like the quotations make sense where they are. Again, like Matthew does this, the more I look at it, it seems deliberate. He's not just kind of writing as he thinks about this stuff. He said, okay, I want this quotation here. I want this quotation here. I want to be with this parable over here and this parable over here. That's the way he did it. It's very deliberate. He showed great care in the balance and the placement of these fulfillment quotations. And of course, we observe this to ask the question, why? You know, why does it matter to Matthew where the quotations go? The fulfillment's true no matter where you put it. I mean, it doesn't matter where you put it, so to speak. But Matthew, he thought about where he wanted it. He put them where he wanted them. And now we have to ask the question, why there? Well, I think altogether, he wants you to have this understanding throughout all of this. Whether you're in the first half, whether you're in the second half, whether you're thinking about understanding, whether you're thinking about the final judgment, no matter what you're thinking about in all this stuff, he wants you to understand the kingdom of heaven as the fulfillment of God's past actions. He wants you to understand that all of this is connected to everything God has already been doing long before Jesus even came. <clears throat> first of all, to just narrow down both quotation and what they can tell us on this point, first of all, the disciple must understand that ignorance is part of the plan, that the world's inability to comprehend these things is also part of what God is doing. That's what we learn from the Isaiah quotation, right? You have this thing back there talking about how people don't understand truth, you know, the closing of their eyes and their ears. Well, that's part of the plan. Now, it's kind of a difficult thing. I mean, just think about our predicament here as Christians. It's very easy to believe that we're correct. It would be easier if everyone else agreed with us, right? If the entire rest of the world said, oh, yeah, Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Savior, everyone should follow Jesus. Well, then it'd be, pretty, it'd be pretty straightforward, right? It'd be pretty easy to be a Christian in that kind of context. Well, the disciple does not have that luxury. The disciple does not have this chance to go along with the crowd. The disciple has to maintain his steadfast faith despite a world that fails to understand him, fails to understand what he believes, fails to understand why he believes it, fails to understand everything he does. The rest of the world just doesn't get you, right? And you have to deal with that. Now, yeah, I think it's easier for you to deal with that. Far easier for you to deal with that if you understand that truth has always faced widespread ignorance. That's always been the plight of God's true faithful people. They've always had to deal with a world around them that just doesn't understand. Case in point, Isaiah. He talks about this stuff back in his day. Jesus is dealing with it again. I mean, there you go. It's always been this way. I think it makes it easier to bear this if you bear that in mind. Because, you know, like right now you see all this stuff going on, how, the way the culture treats us and the way they talk about Christians. The temptation is to think, am I wrong here? Am I too narrow-minded? Is it true that I'm just a bigot like everyone says I am? Is that true? Well, no. It's just they're just doing exactly what they've always done. They have always resisted the truth of God. They've always been ignorant. It's not my fault. It's their fault. It's the darkness of their hearts just as we've seen in the past, right here. The disciple understands that and is helped by that. That's the first quotation. Second quotation. The disciple must understand that truth has always been difficult. It's always been a hard thing to sit there and learn truth and live by it. That's what we learn from the quotation from Asaph, the one that talks about this truth hidden, these parables. Parables are a remarkably difficult way to teach. If you don't agree with me, I don't know where you've been over the, uh, the past uh, sermon series here in Matthew 13. I've found it difficult. I don't know about you. If you find it easy, maybe that, just mean, maybe, that, maybe that means I'm doing well, okay? If you think all this has been easy, maybe that means I'm just doing a great job. But I find the parables kind of difficult. They've surprised me at every single turn. Every single time in here, I've had to sit there and just think about them really hard, rethink, rethink ways that I've thought about the parables from the beginning. I mean, they're a hard thing here. <clears throat> Parables do that. Now, is that a problem? Well, no. Truth has always been that way. Asaph, Psalm 78, talks about the same thing. What Jesus is doing here in these parables, 
Same thing as in the past. If you're sitting here reading these parables thinking, man, these are kind of a, kind of a difficult way to teach, and you've got to really think really hard to get through these parables, well, the problem is not you. That's the way God has chosen to deal with things. <clears throat> that is the way God has chosen to reveal himself. Truth is going to be difficult. I will say this. Truth is going to be difficult to minds that prefer falsehood. Let me put it that way. Humanity, you know, not exactly the most upright, honest species. You've got to wean your thoughts away from wickedness and darkness in order to get to truth. Well, that's going to be difficult now, isn't it? So again, on all these ways, all of this stuff you see here, this is a fulfillment. This is connected to things that have happened in the past. And Matthew, he places these quotations in both halves so that you have that in your mind as you're thinking about these things. It's going to give you a balanced perspective on the way these things fulfill <clears throat> everything that was happening already in God's plan. So, the, uh, the so what question, again, have you been looking to the past to gain help for the present? Have you been doing this kind of thing? Have you been thinking about you know, the, the difficulties or the blessings of the Christian life, either one, in the context of what God has been doing long before Christ came? Have you been trying to put the pieces together you know, as a whole, trying to view yourself as a connection of what God was doing from the very beginning? I think if you do that, it's more helpful. The, uh, the, new, the Christian... The Christian who only reads the New Testament is a contradiction in terms. That's the thought I would leave with you there. The Christian who only reads the New Testament is a contradiction in terms. You can't have a Christian that does that. It doesn't work. It doesn't work that way. It was never meant to work that way. A true disciple is supposed to understand the kingdom as fulfillment. That's part of the things you're supposed to comprehend as a disciple of Christ. Okay. <clears throat> That's a lot of structure and a lot of summaries, and a lot of reading. Uh, let me go ahead and sum this up one last time, and then we'll, uh, I guess, close the parable series um, altogether. I've called this the disciple of the kingdom, right? Because everything here, trying to focus on what is this disciple like? You know, what does Jesus want you to be like as one of his followers? Well, Matthew has structured this passage to make certain points. The way he's thrown everything in here, it hasn't been random. He's trying to guide your thoughts with the way he's collected these parables and these teachings of Jesus. He's trying to guide you to think about how you're supposed to be a disciple. Now, <clears throat> I went through those four points with you. Rather than give you a point-by-point -point summary once again like I usually do, I actually wrote a paragraph that kind of sums all this up. So this will be kind of a different way of doing it. Same information, just different presentation. So here's how I would... Write all this as a paragraph. Above all else, the disciple understands the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. If there is one mystery which the disciple must understand very well, it is the importance of the final judgment. The disciple especially understands his patience and sacrifice in the context of that final judgment. And the disciple also understands that the kingdom is the fulfillment of God's past actions. That's how I sew it all together. And uh, if you think that's great, then great. If not, then, uh, well, it was a very difficult message. So uh, that's my way of excusing myself. Uh, one last thing. Again, I've been trying to direct your thoughts to asking the question, am I like this? Do I think in this way? Do I understand these things? Do these things challenge my thinking? You know, on the one hand, the big buzzword has been understanding, comprehension. But the knowledge of a disciple is always for a purpose, right? It's supposed to motivate you to do something, it's supposed to draw you forward into Christ-likeness. We need to ask ourselves if we have applied ourselves to both ends of that chain. Have you been over here on the comprehension side of things? And have you been over here on the transformation side of things as well? Have you been doing both? You know, have you been trying to guide your thoughts in the ways that Jesus, have ind Jesus has indicated here? And have you been changed by them? They're both important. I know it's like Christianity 101. You know, do you practice what you believe? Are you living these things out? But you can never be reminded of that too much because it's a big thing. It's one of, part of what being a disciple is. <clears throat> a disciple is a person who understands these things and lives by them. And that is the summary of all of these parables, all this hard work for that idea. Um, so I hope that has been helpful as we close down these parables. Uh, this is my last chance to ask you for questions or comments on the parables. After this, I will 
not be answering any questions on parables ever again. So anyone have anything now that they want to ask or 